Our first presenter is Sharon Stover, and she is with Philip G. Warner Regent. She is a Philip G. Warner Regent Professor in Communications in Radio, TV, Film Department at the University of Texas. She teaches communications and telecommunications courses and directs the Telecommunication in and Policy Institute. I'm sure she has a good perspective because I know they just did a big research project. Welcome, Sharon. Well, thank you. Thank you to the Farm Foundation for inviting us to share some of the results of some recent research here. Uh, and thank you for that opening, too. I think it's, it's a terrific vindication of a lot of the things that we have turned up in different ways in our research. I'm going to talk about uh, one particular, the results of one particular study. One of my co-authors is, is in the audience here, Roberto Gallardo, over there, and our fearless leader, Brian Whitaker, could not come. He's uh, back in, at Oklahoma State uh, teaching or doing other things. Um, the research that we're going to talk about today was partially funded by the National Agricultural and Rural Development Policy Center, and uh, we really appreciate the opportunity that they provided us to do this particular work. Uh, the origins of this study has, to, has a lot to do with what's on this slide. This slide is, is actually one of our, it's a finding in our study, but it illustrates something that we've seen over many years of research, and it has everything to do with what people call the digital divide. Of course, the digital divide has had a lot of definitions. They've changed over the years. Back in the 90s, the digital divide was who had computers, who didn't have computers. Then it became who had dial-up internet access and who didn't. And now it, it has everything to do with access to broadband, of course. But throughout all of those different measures of the digital divide, we've seen the same patterns occur, and that pattern is, is to, to put it very briefly, is that rural areas lag behind. They lagged in computer ownership and use, they lagged in dial-up, and they now lag in broadband as well. In this particular finding, you can see in 2003, compared to 2010, huge growth in broadband availability, both in metro areas and in rural areas. But we see a the persistence of a divide between the populations in the rural areas, that there's a consistent 13% gap between rural and non-rural. Non so against that kind of background, we weren't really surprised to find this because it's what we've seen statistically over and over again. That, but uh, another impetus for this study was the growing recognition that the internet access has everything to do with um, both economic outcomes as well as capacity building. Capacity building for using e-government services, for using health services, for using education services. And it's becoming more than a way to create jobs and to create, to create improved income, improved household income. So what we did in this study is we meshed data sets that measure both availability and adoption. And so we use the current population survey, which fortunately had, has provided us with very current data, with some older FCC forms, uh, 4777 based data, and the new initiative that grew out of ARA that created the national broadband map, and we had access to a couple of data sets from that. The third, the, another thing that isn't on this slide that we worked into some of our analyses, maybe we'll, we can get into this in the discussion, is connect Con Connected Nation gave us the locations of um, programs in two of their states. So we were actually also able to look at the possible impact of Connected Nation programs. Uh, I'm not going to get into that squarely here, but we'd be happy to talk about that later. So the utility of this was meshing availability and adoption data. And basically our analysis looked at those fa at factors 
pertaining to availability and adoption in a variety of counties, both m m metro, micro, and non-core counties specifically. And some of you are probably very familiar with these definitions. Depending on who you're working with or for definitions of rural does change. Somebody told me once that there's about 23 different definitions of rural in the federal government. Uh, and of course, the other definitional issue that this kind of work faces is how you measure broadband. Because the actual measure of broadband has, and what's called broadband, has changed across those data sets. It used to be 768 kilobits down. That was one of the early FCC definitions. And then the National Broadband Plan came out and uh, espouse this, this definition of four megabits down, one up, and, and so forth, and the data. So, so this is something that we had to keep in mind as we were, as we were working with the data. Um, so I'm gonna run through some very, very quick, big picture results, and the first one is a, is a map that those of you in the back probably can't see all that well. But fundamentally, this map is illustrating the county level household broadband adoption rates. This is from just a couple of years ago. And what we're looking at here is the presence of red or pink, basically. That's probably something that you can see from further back. Because those are the percentages with the worst broadband adoption rates. And as you can see, we still have a lot of pockets around the country that do not have very high adoption rates. Um, the, the dark blue, in contrast, represents areas where there's over 80% adoption. The red is under, is zero to 20, zero to 20, 20%. Percent. There, I can't see it very well on my screen either. either. The, um, on the next slide, you can see we plotted the, nation, the number of wireline providers. Now this is significant because of course a lot of, a lot of federal money and a lot of money period has gone into expanding access to broadband. And this illustrates as of 210 the number of residentially wireline broadband providers. This isn't wireless, although we do have some wireless information in our, in our larger report. And here too, when you look at this map, the presence of the red uh, splotches on the map represent the existence of very limited numbers of providers, one or two. We, uh, we did not map zero providers here. Everything was aggregated up to the, up to the county level in general. But as you can see, the darker colors show, uh, il illustrate regions of the country where there's good competition among wireline broadband providers, the red one or two, the pink three or four providers. That's significant because, of course, we know that where there are fewer providers there, and less competition, prices are also higher. Um, I would venture to say, although this is not in our data, that in those uh, red areas, we also uh, represent areas that don't have complete countywide coverage of broadband as well. Another, another map, which is a little bit different, here we have a lot of red dots uh, mapped over onto metro and micro and non-core areas. And I just want to draw your attention to the non-core regions which have a background, the green background here. Those are areas that I think we would readily recognize as areas of the country that are, that are predominantly rural. That's not to say that a lot of uh, micropolitan areas also don't qualify as rural, but the green in particular. What we did there is overlay the percentage of the population with no broadband availability. So wherever, and the size of the red dots, which all has sort of merged into a mass on this particular slide, illustrates the size of the population that lacks availability. But this map, I think, visually illustrates the simple presence of non-availability of broadband. And as you can see, it's still, uh, it's still a problem. <laughs> There's still a lot of reported non-availability. The source of this is the national broadband map. That's the telecom providers themselves who have provided this non-availability data. So uh, that would suggest that there's still a ways to go. We still have some work 
uh, left out, uh, cut out for us just in terms of providing infrastructure. Getting on to the real guts of our analysis, however, we wanted to look at some over time comparisons in order to map some of the impacts of the growing availability of broadband. We were especially interested in economic influence and the possible effect of growing numbers of providers in different regions. And we were interested in issues pertaining to speed the speed of service. As I said before on that first slide, we found that predictable gap that, that we kind of knew would be there. Um, but one thing that I didn't illustrate there is that what we found was that the gap between metro and non-metro uh, adoption of broadband actually increased in low-income populations. It increased in low-income populations, in less educated populations, and among the elderly. And that was a pretty striking finding, suggesting we're kind of falling behind among certain population groups. And that suggests a target for future work. Um, we also found that, of course, as that earlier slide illustrated, that broadband counties did have significant improvement in their broadband adoption. But among those who did not adopt, the traditional factors were the key predictors of why they didn't adopt. And those traditional factors are income and education and minority, minority status. Um, in this slide, we've just illustrated um, the differences between metro, micro, and non-core. And I simply want to draw your attention to the right-hand column, which is the non-core, the really very rural areas, and to this big swath of pink up there. And comparing the pink areas across geography illustrates that there are many more non-core counties, the right-hand column, with, with over 40% of their population lacking access to broadband. So there's huge disparities on this countywide basis. And when we looked at why, uh, they were the variables that I just mentioned before. When we looked at economic influence, we found that employment levels in specific industries, uh, and those specific industries were technology-related or the so-called fire industries, finance, insurance, real estate industries, um, were affected by the, the opportunity to use broadband, by, by broadband adoption. We also found conclusively that speed was beginning to matter, and we saw that in some of the the later data sets, the 2010 and 2011 data sets, that increased speed became incentives for people to adopt. There were also increases in broadband adoption that resulted in higher income and in higher total employment. And we found this through, uh, through a matched analysis looking at counties that were paired on, every, on other factors accepting broadband. And that enabled us to kind of pull out the impact of broadband. So this was a very striking finding that, that, we, that we were happy to see. Broadband adoption thresholds seem to have more impact than broadband availability on economic health indicators, which does make a lot of sense and leads directly to some of the policy recommendations that we would, we would offer. Of course, we've had a lot of big programs, federal programs under ARA and other programs remain today that are funding broadband infrastructure and trying to push or pull broadband infrastructure out to less economically robust regions. Our results suggest we need to continue to do that. One blind spot in many of the programs has been actively working with vendors, the telecom providers, to improve adoption. I know this isn't part of kind of the cultural, uh, it's not part of the cultural DNA for a lot of telecom providers to actually work with people on adoption on how to use this technology and what to do with it, how it could be useful. So in addition to getting broadband out there, we think the demand side, adoption really needs some work and that vendors should be a very logical target for this because they would benefit from it. Uh, focused adoption programs, focused on vendors. The FCC has a program that they just rolled out last year. Um, there are other programs 
that, that are associated with extension education, but focusing adoption programs on populations specifically with lower incomes and education would also be extremely useful. Since we found place-based differences have become less important over time, we're recommending that a, a lot of programs that are trying to work on adoption use community anchor sites which can demonstrate and build on classic diffusion factors like offering trials, offering demonstrations, showing ways that, this, that these technologies could be useful to people would be a very fruitful avenue for, for uh, remediating policy. We found that wireless uh, availability seems to help, and indeed there's growing data that suggests that people are in fact accessing the internet from their wireless devices. One worrisome part of that data, however, is that low-income populations are using wireless as their only point of access to the internet. Now, depending on the device that they're using, uh, that may, uh, may or may not be a very good thing. If they're accessing the internet only on their cell phone, which is, their one, which is one charge, one access charge, uh, which is probably the most desirable access charge because people love their mobile phones, everybody wants a mobile phone, these phone-based ac phone access to, inter to the internet isn't maybe the most productive for filling out job applications, for engaging in distance education, for filling out any kind of form, or engaging in any of the new services that kind of embody the promise of the internet. So we're really cautious on wireless access at this stage. Uh, wireless access to the internet and really feel as if we need a lot more data on affordability and pricing, not only of wireless in access to the internet, but wireline access to the internet as well. So thank you very much.